Well, good morning, and I would now like to formally open this meeting, and may I ask everyone to switch off their mobile phones and any other electronic devices as they may interfere with the sound system. Uh, no apologies have been received, and can I welcome everyone uh, to this meeting of the Public Petitions Committee. Uh, today's meeting is just uh, one agenda item to take further evidence as part of our consideration of petition PE1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish mesh survivors on mesh medical devices. Members have a, a note with the clerk and also with us today is Neil Finlay, uh, who has an interest in this petition and I welcome Mr Finlay to, to this meeting. Uh, our fir first witnesses today are from the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, MHRA. Uh, may I welcome Dr Neil Maguire and Sally Mounter from the MHRA. And can I invite Dr, Mag Dr. Maguire to make a brief statement for around five minutes and then we'll move to questions. Of course. Um, first, I'd like to thank the committee very much for this opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, the second thing I must say is that everybody in the MHRA um, greatly sympathises and recognises the serious complications that women have had um, as a result of surgical procedures and the complications they've had of those surgical procedures. Um, just to briefly outline the role of the MHRA, our, our remit is to make sure that the medical device directives are followed by manufacturers and that is done through notified bodies who, who look after the medical device directives in relation to manufacturers on our behalf. And we are there to ensure that goods that are manufactured and brought to market have a CE mark, and that CE mark shows that those devices have complied with the relevant medical device directives that are in place at any given time. Um, the directives are enshrined in European and UK law, and we have certain responsibilities within those directives as the competent authority. And most of our work is making sure that those directives are adhered to by the relevant parties. And once the device is on the market, we actually then monitor it through adverse incident reporting, through reports from notified bodies, from manufacturers reporting, by engaging with professional bodies, listening to what patients say, engaging with regulators around the world and with other competent authorities. So basically what I'm saying is that patient safety is a team sport. It's actually a mixture of regulation and all of the other people who are part of that process. One of the things that people don't always understand is that we have no influence over clinical decisions made between individual practitioners, surgeons in this case, and their patients. But what we do is we work with organisations such as NICE, NHS England, NHS Scotland, other devolved administrations to make sure that we're all working together for the purposes of patient safety. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Maguire. Would you have anything to say? Ms Mounter? No. no. Okay. Right, we'll now move to questions. Uh, Ms Mounter, as Dr. Maguire said, their manufacturers are required to undertake post-market uh, surveillance to ensure that their products are safe and fit for their intended purpose. Uh, can you advise the committee how does the MHRA ensure manufacturers undertake that effective post-market scrutiny? This is done through um, the notified bodies, and the notified bodies audit manufacturers to make sure that they are undertaking those processes. But actually, if you take one step back, before a manufacturer can get a CE mark, they must provide evidence, as is, as is required by the medical device directives, of their post-market surveillance plan. And we at any time, either through the notified bodies or directly, can make those inquiries of manufacturers. And it's part of the process that we continue to look at those, um, those feedback mechanisms to us. Okay. 
Now, in your introduction, you did say that notified bodies as, as a kind of team sport, and you know, whilst the MHRA have responsibility for the notified bodies within the UK, I, I did notice that you know the a manufacturer, for example, can go to another notified body uh, somewhere else in Europe. Uh, how then are you? What kind of assurance can you give the committee, and indeed others, that whenever an incident is, is, is brought to you know brought to the cold face, as I say, how how then are you? What kind of assurance can you give us that, that that's fully investigated? We actually work with all the other competent authorities across Europe and indeed with regulators worldwide. But if we're just talking about Europe, we actually have a monthly um, vigilance teleconference with all of the competent authorities. And for example, with MESH uh, and TAPES, they are a standing item on that agenda. Um, in terms of other devices, we work together as competent authorities. We undertake joint inspections of notified bodies across the European Union as part of the European Commission's drive to harmonise standards. So we take part in their audits of notified bodies in their countries, and they also take part in audits in the UK. And we found that that collaborative inspection auditing has actually strengthened the whole process because we were aware there were potential weaknesses in that system. So you then said, Dr Maguire, that a notified body in the UK works under the same criteria, strict criteria, as that of its EU counterparts? Yes. OK. Uh, just one other question. In Scotland, all adverse incidents should first be sent to Healthcare Facility Scotland. What relationship does the MHRA have with the Health Facility Scotland in investigating such reports? We have a very good working relationship um, and we regularly have contact so that any reports that come to us go into our reporting systems and are investigated as necessary. But Part of the process is we don't just investigate. What we also do is look at trends in reporting because there may be a situation, for example, where somebody reports something in one particular location and to them that's an individual report and that's, that's not a very strong signal to them. But if 10 different people in a similar location report the same kind of incident, then we can see there's a trend and something is, is out of the ordinary and then we would investigate further as opposed to... Because we have daily meetings, weekly meetings, um, looking at incident reports, trending, and then we also have higher level supervision of the trending that comes in and it's looked at from... Uh, I don't know about if you know the type of people that work within the MHRA, but there are scientists, engineers, doctors, researchers, statisticians. And each of those groups brings something different to the equation. But the common group in, in all of these interactions is the clinical team. Because certain aspects of devices are purely engineering and biochemistry or, 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 or whatever. But the key to all of this is as I said at the beginning, is patient safety. And you have to interpret that information with a, a clinical perspective. Now, within the MHRA, we have some expertise. We don't have all the expertise. It's not possible to do that. But what we have is access to healthcare professionals who have, ac who have um, expertise in all of the clinical areas where we require extra advice. And the clinical team takes all that information in and then looks at that and says, right, this is, the, this is the balance here. Because when we're investigating and we're taking action, we have to be proportionate and we have to work on the scientific evidence and the best evidence that's available. Because if we, say for example, if we applied regulation to the strictest criteria there would be no innovation. There would be no products coming into the market. And patients would not get early benefit from 
new devices and new technology because technology is just turning over so fast that I mean there are 500,000 medical devices out there that we regulate and the highest risk devices are something like 90, 90 plus thousand devices and so that's why the systems we have in place are about surveillance about working together with all of the groups to make sure if say example you, you put the product on the market and you've been watching the trend of, of how it's performing and suddenly you get a whole flurry of reports in that might be due to a fault in manufacturing there may be a bad batch of something going through the system and we can pick that up and then we can go and investigate that and we've had examples um, in the not too recent past where we saw an incident like this there was suddenly a whole group of failures of devices coming into the agency from different sources and we went to investigate we went back to the manufacturer and said what has changed and what they've done is they changed their manufacturing facility from one country to another and they now had a, a, a workforce that was not as highly trained as the previous workforce and the manufacturing tolerances changed so we picked up those changes and we went back to them and we said this is not good enough this needs to be fixed within a period of time we agreed it because it was all about the manufacturing process and between the manufacturer the notified body and the MHRA the manufacturing was brought back into proper tolerances and the amount of incidents as the old stock was diminished because it wasn't practical to remove all the stock we warned clinicians that there was a potential problem and if they experience the problem then report to us and stop using that batch for example um, to make sure that there was a constancy of supply as well as making sure that the corrective actions were taken so it's always a balancing act you, so that's where the proportionality comes in you can't just suddenly pull a whole load of things off the market if there's a small problem because if you do that there may be nothing to use so again this is this is a highly complex area there is there are so many interacting factors which we have to make judgments on which is why we engage with the widest possible community to, to make this um, a reality Okay. John Wilson. Good morning. I, I note the MHRA's uh, report relies heavily on the York University Health Economics Consortium report from 2012. Uh, and they reported that there was significant variance in the complications as a result of mesh implants, and it's unclear as to the rates of adverse incidents in Scotland or the rest of the UK. What's the continued basis for MHRA continuing to promote the benefits uh, of this device against the risks? One of the things <coughs> that, again, is, is not well understood is that regulation in its, in its present form and probably will be into the future is about judging risk. When you look at benefit, that's where the shift occurs into the clinical community. So what we have to balance is, is the device in itself inherently safe because it complies with all, complies with all the regulations? Um, and then when it's used, is it being used in, in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions? Is it being used in the way it was intended to be used? And then there is a, there is a spectrum of... The device at one end of that spectrum and at the other end it's clinical practice and application of that device in a clinical scenario now as I said earlier on we don't have any influence over what the clinician does on a day-to-day -day basis that's a judgment for the clinician in conjunction with informed consent with the patient now that doesn't mean I'm weasel wording to say that we're not involved in this process because we are and that's why we're so heavily involved in the Scottish Independent Review, which is moving forward as we speak, and with the NHS England Working Group, which is achieving the same. And we understand that there is the device perspective and then there are clinical perspectives, but that question involves the 
information which has been reviewed by NICE, which have produced quite clear guidance on a number of occasions about the use of these devices, plus backed up by Sir Bruce Keogh's letters of 2012 and 2013, which reinforced that clinicians should use the devices in the appropriate way, with the appropriate training, and audit their practice um, under particular measures which are, which are in, in their guidance um, because complication rates have been difficult to interpret previously. But if you look at the fact that there have been over 3.5 million devices um, sold across the world, 170,000 in the UK, and something like 130,000 operations in England, that is. I don't have the figures for operations carried out in Scotland. We are not seeing the level of complications that you would expect from the information that we've been given by various patient groups who tell us that there are hundreds and thousands of women who have serious complications when the evidence from the literature, from those studies done by NICE, completely independent of the MHRA, from the reporting we're getting, puts those serious complications into the same ballpark. We, we don't have that evidence at all, and that evidence is not available across the whole world. And there are no competent authorities, there are no regulators across the world who have actually taken steps to withdraw these products. Now, what I'm aware of is that there have been two small Australian companies that have been pulled from the TGA's register, but to us, without having had the opportunity to speak to them, because it only happened a couple of weeks ago, it looks like it was technical issues with their documentation, and it is, there's no, nothing that says that it was done on the grounds of patient safety. So there is no new information there. And in fact, we have just seen the TGA's report from 2013, which uh, was, has, has just delivered to the NHS England Working Group, which just goes through the same things, but actually slightly behind in terms of timescales for our own production of evidence, but doesn't actually make any recommendation or come to any firm conclusions uh, about further action or direction. And what we're wanting to see with the independent review in Scotland and the NHS England Working Group is that we're looking to the future because it doesn't matter how small these serious complications are in terms of rates. What we want to see, and I'm talking as a working group member now, is that when somebody does have a complication, that it is recognised and there is a treatment pathway in place for it because we don't want to be seeing all these adverse incident reports becoming more and more and more. What we want to see is that when there is something that is a complication of a surgical procedure, that somebody takes it seriously and does something about it. So that, I hope that somewhat answers that question. Thank you for the response. <clears throat> and I'm sure other members will have questions arising from that response, because you've certainly raised a number of issues in my mind. Information that might be of assistance to Mr. Wilson is that could I, in relation to the the, the point that's just been made. I'll let John. It's, sorry, sorry, John. <clears throat> Thank you, convener. It's really just as I said, uh, there are a number of issues that have been raised uh, in that response. But could you tell me whether MHRA has any views in the issues between mesh implants for SUIs and uh, pop procedures? Uh, is there any views on that, or do you have any views at all on how uh, these devices are being used in procedures? Because you, you seem to continue to refer to the clinical use of the device rather than the, the device itself. Yes, the, the, devices, the device and the devices have been through the relevant procedures to satisfy the regulations in all countries. And as a regulator, we have overseen that process. And once that process is complete, 
may have been given a CE mark or in, or in the United States the appropriate approvals for use. And you could, in the strictest sense of interpretation, say that we could step back and then not be involved any further. But that's not how we see our place in this situation. Because when we see that there are signals where there are complications and issues, we want to be part of the process to make sure that we're getting as much information as we can and the people are feeding back to us as best they can and we can then all move forward and act, act together. But what, what I said before about the signals that are coming from all different sources are giving us virtually the same complication rates. Now, it is definitely the case that complication rates for stress urinary incontinence surgery are lower than for pelvic organ prolapse. But what has to go into the mix here is that pelvic organ prolapse is a very complex illness of itself. And it has a natural history of deterioration, if not treated. And even with treatment, and this is from my understanding from, from clinicians, because I'm not an obstetrician and a gynaecologist, and, and the reality is this is a question for them. But what we're seeing in terms of complication rates is that for certain aspects of the procedure, the complication rates are not particularly high, but when it comes to sexual function, that, that is up into the 15% range. But to put that into balance, up to 70% of patients who have pelvic organ prolapse and urine incontinence have problems with sexual function before they have surgery. And, and the, this is from the published literature. And following surgery, that improves. Okay. Convener, excuse me, excuse me, John. Uh, listen, I, I'm sure everybody agrees that there's a great interest in this, right? But we really need to be following parliamentary uh, code here. And, you know, I would ask the, you know, the people in the public gallery uh, that we really need to hear the answer to the questions. We may not agree with that, but we really need to hear the answer. Ms McGuire, would you like to continue? Are you finished? Um, what I was saying was that if we had a higher level of reporting which showed that there were more complications than, than we're seeing, then we are always prepared to change our view. So if we had thousands upon thousands of reports to say that this was an issue that, that wasn't with the complication rates that were, were deemed acceptable by the clinical community, then we would change our stance. But we can't act without information. And that information does not appear to be out there. There is The other thing to balance in, in this situation is there are thousands and thousands of women who have had these procedures who have benefited greatly. And stress during incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse are distressing and unpleasant conditions which women seek treatment for. And that's aside from saying there is something like, and this is from NHS England figures, about 6 million people in the UK who have got some form of urinary incontinence. incontinence. Now, not all of those seek help, because that would completely overwhelm the health service, but that's just to put these kind of things into, into, into context so that we don't go down the line of disadvantaging people who are going to be helped and have been helped in large numbers from having these sorts of procedures. And that's where the proportionality again comes in, in our considerations, in our actions, and this is why we've engaged so heavily with the clinical community. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, British Association of Urological Surgeons, and the British Society for Urogynaecologists are all in agreement, and you will all have seen their letters expressing surprise at the, the stance that was taken in Scotland regarding the, the request to suspend these surgical procedures. And we are working with those people 
and with NICE and with patient groups to find a way forward to address the serious concerns that those affected by the serious complications have. But we are not in a position with the information we have to take any further action. Now, the other criticism that has been made of us is that we haven't issued alerts. We haven't put out an MDA or, or made the manufacturers put out a field safety notice. But actually, that was considered in 2012. And the decision was made was because this was so much uh, in the clinical domain that it was better to come from Sir Bruce Keogh and Professor Keith Willett, and then later reinforced again by Sir Bruce Keogh. So well, that's why we haven't put out alerts. And people have said, why haven't we done it now? Because of the things the FDA have done. We actually work a different regulatory system to the FDA. And the, the, the information they put out is different. The, one of their last statements was that the complications were not rare. Now, we don't know what that means. We don't know what n not rare means. And we can't, we can't base <laughs> regulation on that kind of statement. At least we're working to the numbers that are coming in from all different places, not just from one single source, not just from adverse incidents, but from the clinical community, from scientific papers, some of which are randomised controlled trials. And if you want to see that information, I don't have it at my fingertips, but that is, is all the information that's looked at by NICE before they produce their guidelines. John? Thank you, Convener. And follow-up question to that is, at what point would MHRA recommend that these devices be either classified as high risk or be removed from the market? Because you've, you've made reference to studies and reports and clinical reports. But at what point, what would be the decision or the reporting mechanism that would give MHRA the confidence to either classify these devices as high risk or recommend that they be removed from the market? These devices are already in the medium to high risk category. So there is, there is no benefit to reclassifying them in, in, in the UK or in Europe. And we've discussed this with our European partners. They're already subject to the appropriate scrutiny for that type of device. In the United States, it's different. Their classification system is different to ours, and you, you can't match them up. Um, and in fact, the United States said they are considering reclassifying, but they haven't done anything about it at this point. They haven't changed their stance. And we, we've been involved in working with them, and we've been to their, uh, their, their public meetings where these sorts of things are discussed. Um, and there is no change to their stance on their website at this time. They have made no moves to withdraw, ban, or, or otherwise restrict these devices. Um, and if they do that, then they will be talking to us first, um, <coughs> as we do with all other devices that, uh, where we, we, we cross over, because a lot of devices are obviously made in the United States. Others are manufactured here, but some of the notified bodies for CE marking in Europe are in this country. So we have, we have regulatory powers um, in, in respect of them. Um, in terms of what, when would we act? Well, it <laughs> this sounds a bit of a feeble answer, but the reality is it depends on the device. It depends on the seriousness of the complications. It depends on the reporting rate and whether the complication rate is outside that which is reasonably expected for that type of procedure given current knowledge. So if the manufacturer and the clinical community had decided that a complication rate of, say, I don't, for, for no, no other reason it's a number, of 5%, and we've, we've done this with other devices, so if all of a sudden the complication rate is 45 5%, 5.1%, 5 then we start thinking we've exceeded what is reasonably expected in this circumstance, given all of the other information about that particular procedure, about the risks associated with it, about the complication rates of other things, plus added into the mix of 
is there something or other other device or the product which could reasonably be substituted which has got a lower complication rate then that would be taken into account as well because as I said before if you suddenly withdraw something and there are still considerable numbers of people benefiting from a particular procedure or a particular use of a particular device they have to be considered as well and that balance will finally come down to the individual discussion between the clinician and the patient and it is up to them to make those judgments provided of course and I can say this as a clinician that the process of informed consent has been undertaken in an appropriate and clear way and one of the the things is that some people when they have the risks explained to them will still have a procedure because their life is being affected so badly by the symptoms that they currently have and they will take that chance and you could say it's analogous to the first people who had hip replacements if you went through that process now and analyzed the results of the first hip replacements and said no 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 it's far too risky with the components are wearing out nobody would have hip replacements now but what we know is the technology improves consistently over time, but yet we still know that if you have a hip replacement at a, at a younger age, within 10 to 15 years, you may well be looking at a revision anyway because of the natural history of all types of, of hip replacement because you can test something to, to destruction in a laboratory, in an engineering plant, but when it comes to implanting it into a biological organism then some of those dynamics change in a way that cannot be predicted and that's where post-market surveillance and where vigilance is important in identifying those things so the natural history explanation i appreciate that but you know we do have a number of questions yes sorry really sorry to ask. so uh, angus you have a supplementary to that Thanks, Convener. Yeah, just to pick up on, on a point uh, Dr. McGuire, uh, McGuire just mentioned, um, and just for clarification uh, on the level of complications, um, are, are you saying that there's no mesh device out there that has a complication rate of over 4.5 or 5 per cent? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, right, just to clarify. Okay. There, there are, if you look at the scientific papers, depending on and, and the research papers and, and, and the things that are published, there are ranges of complications always and those complication rates are a mixture of when the device was introduced the experience of the surgeon the surgical team the developments of the device so over time in fact when you first introduce any surgical procedure it doesn't have to involve the device then there is an increased rate in complications and that is well recognized across all all medical practice and then over time, the, the learning curve flattens out and then the training programs put in place. There are various guidances issued because then, so going back just one step, when you start doing a procedure, you have in your mind and the manufacturers have in mind if a device is concerned, what the potential complications could be, what has been seen before in conjunction with those types of surgeries, with those types of procedures, with those types of devices, etc. So that's, that's the complication list that goes into their, their, their instructions for use and is, is well known to the medical profession in training, etc. Now, there may be that there are complications that are completely unforeseen and those are the things that have to be picked up and things have to be adjusted. So, for example, when meshes were first used, it wasn't known that the number of anchorage points was significant. So when you go over a certain number, the complication rate associated with that particular design of mesh goes up. But there was no way anybody could have predicted that. But now that is known, the meshes and the anchoring points are, are one of those things that are considered in the new designs of the, the latest devices. So again, it's, it's all about analogy here. I, I, I don't know the way of describing it, but when the first pacemakers were produced. They were huge clunky things with batteries that needed changing far more frequently. The leads that used to go into the heart used to break and that was the risk that went with that new technology. Now over time 
that has all improved. And we are all thankful that the manufacturers have put that effort, that money, that time, and the experience of the surgeons doing those procedures. All medical devices have a similar track record. So devices that were made at the first instance were actually based on surgeons just using mesh that had been used for hernias and thought, well, let's try it in a different place. But then bespoke meshes were produced and bespoke tapes for urine incontinence were produced. And there have been increasing improvements in those technologies over time. And again, it's the balance between offering people surgery and, and medical technology which will improve their lives because they go to seek treatment because their lives are being upset by pain, sexual dysfunction in this particular instance, urinary incontinence, and, and parts of their body coming out where they, they're not supposed to be. And that's highly distressing and very unpleasant. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr Maguire. And Zala? Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, good morning. The MHRA report also notes that there are a number of ongoing research projects which are likely to provide use, useful information in long-term safety and efficiency uh, of the mesh implants. What I would like to know is, what is the scale of these pr projects, and when are they likely to report back? Are you, to are you talking about the... Why, if you, if, if you could be brief in your answer, because we'll have questions. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Um, we know the Prospects trial, which has been um, sponsored by the Department of Health, and that's due to report in 2016... So, yes. yes. Um, there's a nice report which has been produced, which is looking into hospital um, episode statistics, um, and they've had some preliminary work done on that, but I don't know when that's due to complete, but we can certainly find out for the committee and let you know. Um, there's the Scientific Committee on Emerging and um, Newly Identified Health Risks, which is looking at meshes generally. That's supposed to... Um, report in Q1 this year and then of course there's the independent, Scottish Independent Review which is now due to report um, in early summer and the NHS England um, report which is or NHS England led report which is due sometime in the next 12 months but Spring, so. yes but it's it's been moved a little bit because and it's the same as the Scottish Independent Review being moved because they're realising the amount of information, the complexity of it is, is so great that if you're going to do it properly, you might as well take the time to do it properly. And we will be completely receptive to the findings of all of those reports and take them on board. Well, it would be extremely helpful if you, if you could pass some of that information back to the committee. Yes, of course. OK. Uh, Kenny? Thank you. You've already obviously given a, a, an anecdotal... De description about issues related to the manufacturing process and referred to the uh, TDA report. Uh, it didn't seem, seem to differ between products, but other factors such as skills and training, selection of patient and procedure. Uh, to what extent are adverse incidents, in your view, due to clinicians' actions, and how does this influence your assessment of the device? Right. We as an agency, want every adverse incident to be reported to us. Because to the person doing the reporting, it is not always apparent which end of the spectrum that is. So our judgments then are around, has the device failed? Has the device got a problem that we weren't aware of? But we would then go to our experts who are advising us and say, is this a recognised complication of this type of surgery, of this type of procedure? What was the level of training of this? So all of those things we'd pull together. So we would act as the honest broker in the middle of that situation to try and determine whether it was the device that was the problem it's in, in itself or whether there was an interaction between the device and the surgical procedure and, 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 and in that particular circumstance or whether it was actually a purely clinical issue. Because until you, until you view that spectrum, you can't make a judgment. But we're happy to get all the reports. And we're actually working now even more closely with the NHS, um, the, the National Reporting and Learning System, so that 
all reports that go into NHS England um, and come from Scotland eventually because they're, they're looking at being part of that as well, I understand. Um, we will have a much broader base of reporting of incidents because in the NHS, and I, I may be completely wrong on this number, but I think there's something like a million reports of adverse incidents come into the National Reporting and Learning System every year. And they're able to search all of that data. And we are now being given access to search it ourselves and make it into one database and make a single portal for reporting to make it easier for clinicians and, uh, and other folks to uh, um, report. And we've also streamlined the um, reporting to the MHRA directly, so the yellow card now covers drugs and devices. So that's all moving forward. And we're looking for a Euro There's also an initiative to produce a European database, which will cover all of, all of Europe as well. But, of course, that depends on the European Parliament and those decisions. Okay. Uh, David. Thank you, Kavina, and good morning. Evidence, evidence suggests that there may be an underreporting of adverse incidents. Can you tell me why there has been underreporting, and what is the MHRA's view on the petitioner's call for mandatory reporting by all clinicians? We know there's underreporting. We know that healthcare professionals have not been as good as they could be, and in our view, um, should be. Um, and that's why we've had to consider evidence from all different areas. But one of the things, that, and we discussed this at the, the Scottish Independent Review meeting yesterday, and I was having a think about it. We were actually talking slightly across purposes. Because when you say mandatory reporting to me as a regulator, that is something that carries a regulatory sanction if you don't do it. Now, that's not the same as a profession saying to its, its members of its organisation or whatever it is that you should report this as part of good medical practice and if you don't do it, then we will ask questions about you know, how fit you are to practice and to do these procedures, etc. That's a different thing altogether. Because what we know from experience is that if you have a mandatory system which carries sanctions... First of all, which carries a sanction if you did it wrong in the first place and then carries a sanction um, which comes from the report, then reporting goes right down because people don't report to put their neck in a noose. And some of the most tightly regulated systems uh, for reporting have come from Eastern Europe um, and their reporting is some of the lowest that there is anywhere. So what we're working together towards is a collaborative system, and that's part of the working group in England and the Scottish Independent Review, is engaging with all parties to improve reporting and making sure that the, the positive incentive is that the culture is to report, the discussion of the, the, the problem that's been exposed by the reporting is open and free and not subject to sanction, and that in doing that, we're all serving patient safety much more strongly. And the last bit in that is people who report have to have feedback. If they don't get feedback, there's no incentive to report again. Now, that's a loop that we have never properly closed because it is such a, a big issue covering so many different devices. And that's not just a problem for MHRA, it's a problem for all regulators <coughs> Uh, and, and that is something that we're, we're looking hard at, but it will only be solved by everybody working together. And as I said right at the very beginning, this is a team sport. And if we're not all working for the same thing and people don't understand why it's important to do these things, they're just not going to do it. So if we say mandatory from a regulatory perspective, we don't think it will work. If you say mandatory from the perspective, and this, this is going to sound a bit foolish, mandatory voluntary reporting within a professional set, set of circumstances with incentives to do that, we believe that that will produce results. And it certainly has worked for orthopaedic surgeons to the point where the National Joint Registry um, and MHRA have been working so closely together. We've got to a situation, where, situation whereby 
they are working beyond compliance, and by that reporting is is above that required for any regulations. And the manufacturers have signed up to that, and they're part of that process. And we sit around the table together with the clinicians, with the manufacturers, and we have results now on joint replacements that have been done over the last 10, 10, 20 years. And what happens with that information is manufacturers then go out and say, look, we've got a 10-year tick. Our devices have, have got a survival rate up to 10 years, and the incentive for them is to be part of this process so that they're, they're being shown to be responsible in what they're doing. Angus. Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. Um, in the October report from the MHRA, it uh, concludes with proposing uh, the following actions. Um, improved reporting of incidents, which you've uh, just mentioned, a structured post-market clinical follow-up, registries on the use of unique uh, device identifiers, and patient-reported outcome measures. What progress has been made on uh, taking these suggestions forward? And what role um, would the MHRA envisage for the Scottish Government uh, in that process? All of those things are really important. That's obviously why we put them in the report. We are very keen on the idea of registries. The difficulty for us is that we can't have registries for all of the medical devices that we look after. That would be completely impractical. We'd have to have 10 times the number of people we have. The only thing we would say is whoever sets up a registry needs to engage with the people who want the information out of the registry because there have been registries set up in the past which have not provided the information that's required and it becomes useless. So if you, if you put the right things in at the beginning, you get the right information out at the end. So as a regulator, we want the adverse incident reporting whereas the clinicians want the patient recorded outcome uh, measures, and that's what patients need. So it, it's about having all of those things together. And, and from the Scottish Government perspective, and any increase or any um, acknowledgement of the resources that are required to produce those things would actually be really good, because registries are expensive, they require staff, they require data input, individuals. Um, and those, that's one of the impediments to good reporting. And because reporting in the clinical setting lies around being able to do things such as multidisciplinary meetings, morbidity mortality meetings. And those things need to be resourced in terms of time, in terms of people being able to get to them and do them. And, and I'm, only, I'm only saying this not as a regulator, but as these, these were things that were brought up at the meeting yesterday in Glasgow by the clinicians saying, we, we would like to increase our reporting, we would like to be more compliant, but give us more time, give us, give us it in our job plan to be able to do these things and resource us to do it. I think the average morbidity mortality meeting is an hour a week in, in, in my clinical practice. Oh, yeah, but how much time do they need to get their act together with regard to with regard to reporting? That's my point. I think you have to ask the clinicians that. Yeah. Jackson. Good morning. Um, I, can I take you back to this um, York University report in November 2012? Because we've quoted quite extensively from it this morning, and also you have quoted from it and relied upon it in your November 2014 submission. Um, when in 2012 was the report commissioned? I can't answer that question, but Sally can. Um, it was around January, February time, 2012. Okay. What budget did it have? Or what was the cost of the report? Uh, I haven't got that to hand. It was something like... Mm, something like £40,000, I think. I, I, Forty. i I've... How many people at York University were involved in its production? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure how many. We were, we were liaising with about three people. Three. But they may well have had team people, teams of people behind okay. them. Um, what call for evidence did York University uh, issue in advance of their consideration of the issue? 
we we had, we had provided they they put together a protocol and they were it was largely a literature review that's what it was it was a literature review a literature review yes it's a similar sort of thing mm. that nice have done um mm. when they do literature searches I but, see. but they look at they, they take evidence in a particular way so if you look at the procedures that nice mm. go through to to get their information they okay. start with the 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 highest evidence levels and but, then they work down to case reports. But a 40,000 report commissioned by three people without any call for public evidence in November 2012 is regarded as being in the light of everything that has happened since a sufficient basis two years later and after the petition has been lodged here in May 2014 with what appears to be sufficient grounds the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing in Scotland to issue a call for a moratorium on these uh, meshes being installed. That report from November 2012 appears to you in October 2014 to be sufficiently robust to allow you to continue to make the recommendation you are. If you review the report that we've just produced, it draws on more information and it, Such does as. Not, and it does not just rely on the... Such as, I, I mean, I've got it here. It used data from adverse incident reporting, manufacturers, sales figures, patients, although I understood you to say you thought that they were unreliable as an evidence base, representatives, clinicians, manufacturers, other regulators around the world. Are these all um, literature-based surveys? I mean, what, what further evidence was taken by MRHA in uh, its its consideration of its, of its recommendation? Or yeah. was it just a bigger literature review? No, it wasn't a, just a bigger literature review. We looked at manufacturers' own reporting. We looked at... And bear in mind that the manufacturers under the device regulations only have to report certain incidents that come under the heading of vigilance. What we did is we went back to the manufacturers to look at all of the reports that they've received in these circumstances, things that didn't even get to the level of vigilance. And this is something that we, we do with clinical investigations, for example. So we take, we take all of the signals that we see and put them into the equation as well to see if they have an additive value or benefit. We also engage directly with the clinical community who were doing surgery for problems with meshes we also discussed it with the senior people in those professional areas. We also have soft signals, which you see from engaging with people who are speaking at conferences, who are looking at things that don't actually get it to be published, but, but posters and, um, and, say, presentations. Right. And different people reviewing different aspects of their research and the literature. But... It's about accumulated experience with these devices, so that's why we also engaged with authorities across the globe to see if they'd received any other information that would lead them to act in any different way, okay. and they did not do that. So and we realised that the York report had limitations, which is why we went to those extensive efforts for the report that we produced for the in, Chief Medical Officer for England. But this is where I'm at a loss. You said that um, various organisations and parties expressed surprise when the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing in Scotland, with all party support in this Parliament, called for a moratorium in June last year. Do you believe he was acting irresponsibly then in making that call? I think that would probably be a question that I wouldn't answer because... Well, I take my, that my, to my, mean my, yes. Yeah, no, no, no. My, I take that to mean yes. Um, health boards have... Some health boards have ignored the Cabinet Secretary's call for a moratorium and have used the MHRA uh, a report as the basis for ignoring the Health Secretary. Are you comfortable with that? I'm comfortable with the fact that we have taken all of the robustly available evidence to us into account when we have come to our judgment. But, but where is caution in all of this? Because not a £40,000 report, but a £2 million report 
uh, is one of those to which you have uh, made reference that is going to be reporting back to us near hand. Is there not any, on the basis of that, is there not any need for a degree of caution to suggest that um, the Cabinet Secretary's call for a moratorium is a perfectly sensible uh, call to make until this much, much wider and contemporary and seemingly better researched and founded evidence is made available to us? Our discussions with the Cabinet Secretary and subsequent inquiries we made as to why he took the action he took um, we inquired if there was any evidence, any further evidence, which we had not been made aware of, which led to that decision, and we were told that there was none. And on the basis of no further information, and given the information available to us and across the world, we were not in a position as a regulator to take action okay. to do anything different than we were already doing. All right, I understand that. I mean, you've made analogies at various points today. I mean, I suppose I could make an analogy of a contaminated food substance in a store then being withdrawn across every store in the United Kingdom because the manufacturer doesn't think that the fact that only a handful of people might suffer from it is an acceptable basis for it then being available for sale elsewhere. Uh, and I offer that analogy to you in, in contrast to your own. But I understand and I respect and I appreciate the dispassionate way that you've, you've, you've given the evidence this morning. I understand that has to be the case. But my final question is this. In the light of everything that is happening just now, I would not recommend to a family member of my own that they have a mesh device implanted until the further evidence is available. Would you recommend to a family member of yours that they have a mesh implement, impl implanted at this time? Let's remember the problem. I, I mean, it's a serious then, question. Then, then, I, I, I because these are human... You know, I I know did, sorry, been, I wasn't answering... Me. No, no, you must Jackson, answer questions question to the gallery. Jackson, I'm Jackson Dr Maguire. Yeah. A minute, please. Yeah. Listen. Sorry, I'm very prepared I, I, to answer I, I, that question. Sorry, let me, let me finish. Now you can answer. Listen, we re really need to be aware of the, 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 the conduct within the Parliament. So, as I say, we may hear things that we like, we may hear things that we don't like, but please, let's listen to what's to be said. Yeah. I'm only no. asking... I mean, it's a dispassionate evidence we've given, but these are very emotional issues. And I so in, in my final question, I, yeah, I simply want to yeah, ask what no, you would recommend to I your own family member I completely the understand, time. and I can answer as a husband, as a clinician, and as, as a practicing clinician, what I would say to my wife if she had incapacitating problems with incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse, I would say to her that you need to sit with your clinician who is going to do this procedure and decide what is best for you. I'll come and sit with you. I'm not going to say anything. I will listen to what is being said on both sides. If I want to ask a question of the clinician, then that's what I would do. But at the end of the day, the judgment is, is your quality of life affected to the point at which you would be prepared to accept the risks which are known with this particular procedure? And if you did accept those risks, I would want to be 100% assured that if you had a complication, even if it was something that is not regularly reported, like pain, um, then that would be treated seriously by the whole of the multidisciplinary team, from the general practitioner through to the incontinence nurse, through to the physiotherapist, through to the surgeon and there would be mechanisms in place within that particular health service to deal with those complications effectively. And on top of that, I would want to know that we'd been offered all the alternatives and that the non-surgical alternatives had been properly funded and had been gone through and there had been a point at which the situation without surgery was intolerable and those judgments should be made. Okay. Well, let me conclude finally with this observation. Your experience and background has qualified you to understand everything you've just said that would need to be asked of the clinicians and others performing this potential surgery. I can assure you I've heard from many constituents who had none of the benefit of that advice, none of the benefit of that experience, and who found themselves with a mesh implant with consequences that had not been drawn to their attention at any point in the process whatsoever. 
Thank you, Kajin. Neil. Yeah, I think Mr. Carlo makes some very pertinent points there. The, the point I was trying to get in earlier uh, uh, when Mr Wilson was uh, speaking, I apologise for interrupting, but it was in relation to the Australian situation where the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, um, there, is, there are um, a number of items, mesh items, that have been cancelled. And the reason for them being cancelled is because they don't uh, uh, adhere to the medical devices essential principles checklist. That's the facts of the matter. If you look at what they are saying so on actively their website, administrative, not well, patient it, safety. It, if you look at the general principles, it's about the use of medical devices not comprising uh, complying with health and safety, conformity of safety principles. I could go on and on and on. There's umpteen. It is not a minor administrative error. No, I didn't, be, no, no, no. I didn't say it was a minor administrative error. What I said is that administrative process can be major or minor conformities can with be. regulation. Can. Can. But the TGA says on its website, when you look at those, if there is a question of patient safety, that comes under a separate heading. That separate heading does not apply to any one of those products that have been removed from their register. So that to me, without going into it further and actually question them personally, suggests there is not an issue of patient safety with these devices and that it is due to failure to comply with regulation. Uh, you, you mentioned the words can and suggest, therefore I think we might need to get to the bottom of that. To yes, and we'll be very happy. To, we yes. will speak to TJ very soon and we'll be very happy to come back to the committee. I, I, I was then going to ask him what discussions have you had with TGA about the withdrawal of these products and are any of these products being used in the UK? They are not, as far as we're aware, because the, the, the seven <coughs> major manufacturers of these products are well known to us. And before yesterday, I personally had never heard of this, this, these two uh, manufacturers who are Australian-based, and we're not even sure, because we only found out yesterday, from one of our researchers and then subsequently at the meeting in Glasgow that this had actually happened, which to our mind means that these could, they might not actually be manufacturers at all because under the regulations you become a manufacturer when you import from somewhere else. So we don't even know where their products were being made. So that's part of the inquiries we'll be making. Okay. But we would have expected if TJ were going to do a product withdrawal for patient safety reasons, and we have no reason to believe they wouldn't have done this because they have with all other things, the TJ would have come to us directly before they took that action to let us know they were doing it. In the same way, the FDA do that, um, and other regulators across Europe do the same thing. So we're, we're pretty confident that this is not patient safety related because of our observations so far, but we will definitely be checking now we have that information. Given the um, problems that we have in Scotland with under-reporting and the problems we have in the UK, do you know, could you take a guess, Does any, has anybody taken a guess as to how many uh, problems there has been worldwide with these products? We know from the literature and from our discussions with the other competent authorities and regulators that the complication rates we are seeing are mirrored across the world. How it, does that reflect then the number of people who have uh, submitted uh, claims to courts? Because in, in Scotland we have a very small number. What's the number that you suggest in Scotland the, 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 the figures are? Uh, for adverse incidents. Adverse incidents problems. were reported to us since 2005. It's, um, it's 88 for... Um, for stress urine incontinence, and that was up until February 15, um, for um, prolapsed organs, um, 37. So we could almost suggest that the entire number of those people are sitting behind you at the moment, almost. Um, which seems, and one, which of seems, things, one of the wait, things... Wait, wait, well, I, yeah. I, wait, am I making my point? Which seems inconceivable. We know that there are tens of thousands, indeed probably hundreds of thousands, of litigation cases sitting in courts in the US and Australia. So therefore, are these people making it up? Are they chancing their arm to try and get a few quid out of something? Or do we think, is, it, is, it, is there any assessment being made of whether these are legitimate cases uh, 
of people having the same problems as the people who are in this room today. We, we've, what, what has given us the confidence to, to carry, carry on with the same stance that we've had is that despite all of these cases, that, and there, there have only been four or five actually uh, that I understand in the states have actually happened, of all of those cases, there have been there have been different judgments, and again, it, it's not my area of expertise in any way, shape, or form. But the judgments have been made not on the materials or on the design. They've been about how the products have been used and the instructions the surgeon has had or conveyed to the patients. So we need to understand more about that, but. Actually, those individual cases have not led to any regulatory action in the United States. And you would think if the FDA were being inundated with reports of adverse incidents and that all of those things appear on their MAUD database and there, there are just not those numbers. Okay. And we so find it difficult to reconcile the fact that all of the evidential information we have from literature and from the reports we have, even with under-reporting, do not reflect hundreds of thousands of patients with so, problems. So, given that assumption that you're making, and given your comments earlier that um, when you spoke about pacemakers, etc., that the, the technology is, you know, crude at the beginning and it advances with time, um, what you're saying is that, in your opinion, it is not the product that's the problem. That can only lead me to assume that you think it's the clinical practice that's the problem. We, is, that, is that the case? Is that your opinion that the product is not a problem because you're continuing to allow it to be used? Therefore, the only thing that can be causing the problem is poor clinical practice. I think we have to be careful when we talk about ascribing it to any particular group or any particular area, we have to bear in mind that we're dealing with people who have a serious and complex problem in the first place. They have ongoing other illnesses which have an influence. They have, we all, we all get older and if we smoke and we're overweight, that actually adds to the problems that the surgeon has and the procedural likelihood of complications. So we have to put all of that into the mix. So we can't just blanketly say, so we wouldn't have an opinion that it is any one part of the entire process from selection to device being used to procedure to any part of the whole process has, has potential. Okay, so it's not the, it's not the product you, you you're not prepared to say that then it's clinical practice. Well, let me tell you my experience over the last two years. I've met hundreds of women from across Scotland and beyond. Uh, they come from different towns and cities, geographical locations. They have different socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultures. They come from all over. Some of them have lost their organs. Some of them have to walk using crutches. Some of them use wheelchairs. Some of them have lost their jobs, their marriages, and all the rest of it. They are very different women. They come from all ages and all backgrounds. The only thing they have in common is that they've been fitted with polypropylene mesh and have injuries. Now, is that a coincidence? Do you think that is just a coincidence that that is happening? They're not all overweight. They don't all smoke. No. They, you know, they don't have the characteristics that you... Some of them may have, but I, I find it inconceivable that all of them from all of those backgrounds have one thing in common, and yet the MHRA are not prepared to turn around and look at them and say, they are the evidence that there's a problem here. We are aware that there are many patients who have had serious untoward complications following their surgery and their procedures. The relative contribution of each of the elements related to those procedures has to be taken into account on the background of the complexity of the underlying condition. Now, we can't make judgments on those small number of individuals who have had problems compared with the thousands of patients who have benefited from those procedures 
and have had an improvement in their quality of life as a result of it. This, this is a balance that has to be struck. In all medicine, as I said earlier on, there is a balance between the risk of doing something and the risk of doing nothing versus the benefit of doing something or the benefit of doing nothing. And that is a, that, the final decision rests with the individual patient and the individual clinician as to what's the best thing to do in a particular circumstance. And it involves informed consent, patient selection, picking the appropriate device, following the guidelines that are out there. And if you want to minimize risk, we all have to work together to make that the case. But we cannot get rid of risk. It, there, is, there is no medical procedure, no drug that we take that is without risk. No, but you can minimize risk. Now, my final, final point. One final, final one. Question. We've been full of analogies today, and the analogy I use in this is, is, is like a, a car. If a car produced by a manufacturer had uh, the drivers concerned that there may be a problem with, say, the brakes, even if it's a small number who were reporting that, there would be a recall or there would be a halt in production until that problem was resolved. Why is it that we appear to treat an inanimate piece of metal more compassionately, more um, systematically than we do something that is affecting so badly the lives of so many people? But that, to be fair, isn't what we're doing. What we're doing with, with, no, with, a, with a motor vehicle, what we're, we're not saying to the owner, when you get in the car and you drive it, there's going to be a risk involved because the brakes might not work or whatever it is. Actually, drivers know when they get in the car there's going to be a risk because of the way they drive no, no, it. And yeah, the this, conditions. Is point this is when a problem has been identified by a number of people. So what, what we don't have in, in cars, which, as you say, an animate object, is what is the complication rate for driving a car? We have to accept that with any medical procedure, there is a complication rate, and what we have to make sure is if those complications happen, which they invariably will do, we have things in place that are in the health service and supported by the various agencies, the practitioners, etc., to deal with those complications because they are inevitable. They are going to happen. There's not one thing in medicine that doesn't have a complication attached to it. It is not a risk-free environment. Okay. One final question from uh, John Wilson. Just to follow up from Mr Finlay's questioning, and, and I'll not use the analogy of the car, but I will use the issue about the reporting and the under-reporting of the number of cases. Now, as Mr Finlay said, he's spoken to hundreds of women. And we know by the campaign that's been established in Scotland that there are hundreds of women who have been affected by the mesh implant operation. Now, how do you, as MHRA, justify the failure to take action based on the number of cases that we are now hearing about? Because there is, and you admitted earlier, and your, part of your response to an earlier question, that there is a, an under-reporting because clinicians aren't reporting. And you've actually said whether it becomes voluntary, mandatory reporting or mandatory reporting is an issue that has to be taken forward. But what is the criteria for taking action to stop the use of mesh implant operations in this device based on the responses we're getting as a parliament and this committee is getting from the women throughout Scotland and elsewhere that have had severe effects because of this, the use of this device and the operations that have been carried out and have been carried out for a number of years and are still being carried out. I have to return to the, some of the points I made earlier on that we need, if, if you are aware of hundreds, and we are not seeing those reports, then you need to use your influence, and with our help, then we can, we can subsume those, those numbers into the reporting. Now, that's part of one of the, 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 the reasons for having the Scottish Independent Review and why we've been so keen to be part of it, is because... It is absolutely vital we reconcile this difference between the numbers that are bandied about by 
by various groups, and I don't mean that flippantly. What I mean is we get lots of numbers thrown at us, but we can't work without evidence. And there's no evidence in anywhere else in the world, and we've talked to other competent authorities, we've actually talked to the Bladder and Bowel Foundation in, in the UK and said, are you seeing and hearing of reports of lots of women or men, actually, with, with incontinence who've had procedures and having problems? And they have said, well, no, actually, we haven't. So what I can't understand is why we're not able to reconcile these differences. Because and we, we, we have asked the groups to get everybody to report to us. It doesn't matter if they don't have all the details. If, if we have verified that they're all different people, because we don't want sort of vote rigging, if you see what I mean, uh, but, you know, that we know these are all individuals' reports, then they go into the system and then we have that information. And we have for years requested that information and we have not received it. And that has been the case in Scotland, and that has been the case in England as well. Um, and we're at a loss to explain those differences. And again, when, when uh, Mr Finley said that there were thousands and thousands of women in the United States who are, are, are awaiting litigation, in fact, one of the things that was said to us recently was we actually got a report from a patient we tried to investigate it, and the patient turned and says, I can't give you any more details because my lawyer has told me not to tell you anything. Now, if the legal system is standing in the way of reporting as well, that is a real problem to us. And that, 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 that occurred within the last few weeks. Okay, Dr. Uh, Maguire, can I thank uh, you and uh, Mrs Mountain for giving evidence today to this petition? Uh, I will now suspend until the video link is set up. Thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I can, it would seem, although I can't hear him. Yes, I ah, hear you. Yes, you've got it. Yes. Excellent, superb. Well, the picture's looking pretty good. And if you can just give me a few words for uh, just to let me hear the quality of the sound. Sure, what would you... Uh, can you hear me all right now? Is That's actually through? what you've said up to this point is actually fine. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I think we're ready to go. Uh, our committee members are out and about at the moment. Uh, they're not all fully, they're not in the room. So we'll get back to you in a second when they're all here. Sounds nice. Good one. Yeah. Uh, you didn't hear anything in the room. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Okay. Mr. Slater, can you just uh, say a, a, few, a few sentences for me, just to get the, the public address in the room set? Sure. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Is your test yes, running okay? I can. It's simply a little bit noisy in the room, so I think we'll have to go with that, <laughs> and we'll adjust it as we do okay. it for real. That sounds fine. Whatever you need from me. Thank you. That's that's pretty good actually. That's looking and sounding actually okay. Yeah, it's looking pretty good actually. Yeah, but it's looking a bit peely wally, but nonetheless, it's it's working. I reconvene the meeting. Uh, our second e evidence session today is with Mr. Adam M. Slater from Maisie Slater Katz and Freeman LLC. We are taking Mr. Slater's evidence this morning via video conference from the United States. And can I remind members that a delay will occur between members finishing their questions and the witnesses hearing and responding? Equally, there will be a delay the other way. For these reasons, it's important that no one tries to speak over anyone else and members should speak only if called to do so and should not try to interrupt a colleague or, or the witness as that will affect their ability to hear the answers. Can I welcome Mr Slater and thank him for making himself available at such an early hour to speak to us here in Edinburgh. And uh, I will start by introducing myself. My name is uh, John Pentland. I'm the convener of the Petitions Committee. And I will then go around the table and ask each of the other committee members Trying to just himself. David Torms, Vice Convener of the Committee. Hans Lamalek, Committee Member. John Wilson, Committee Member. Good morning, Angus MacDonald, a Committee Member. Kenny McCaskill. Good morning, Jackson Carlow. Uh, Neil Finlay, not a Committee Member, but interested party. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Can I now invite you then, Mr Slater, to make a brief opening statement for around two to three minutes, and uh, after that we will move to questions. I, I will. Uh, I'd again like to thank uh, all of you for inviting me to provide information to you regarding the pelvic mesh devices. In 2007, I met my first client who had been injured by these polypropylene mesh devices, and since 2007, I've been working uh, almost exclusively on these mesh cases and meeting with many of the leading consultants and physicians in the United States regarding the injuries that women have been suffering and the, the very serious complications that are caused by these products. 
I've been spending a great deal of time studying the literature, and, and again, now we have, in my state, New Jersey, over 7,000 cases for which I'm lead counsel, and I've tried several of these cases and spent a great deal of time, so hopefully the information I can provide to you today will be helpful for you in considering um, the way forward on these very dangerous devices, which, in my experience now, the closest analogy I can find is asbestos something that was thought to be a wonderful invention for a long time, and now everybody in the world knows it's something you wouldn't want to go anywhere near, and it's the closest analogy I can find to these horrible devices that are now in so many women's bodies. So thank you. I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Mr. Slater, and uh, I will ask the first question. Uh, you did mention here that some 7,000 devices have already been implanted in the USA, and uh, can you tell me what recent data is available on the number of these uh, that result in medical device reports? What I can tell you is this. Uh, one of the benefits we have of litigation is that we get to see the internal documents from the companies, documents that they have not shared publicly. And, um, for example, Johnson & Johnson, which is the largest manufacturer, they state in their documents that they have these devices in over 2 million women. The 7,000 number is the number of women that have filed cases in the state of New Jersey. There are about 70,000 or more cases filed in the federal courts that are placed in front of one single judge in the state of West Virginia, and there are uh, very many more cases filed in various other state courts that nobody's been able to count. And I can tell you there are probably tens of thousands of other women who have been harmed who either don't know they can bring a case or... Their complications haven't manifested yet. Um, or in many cases, women found out too late that they had a case and they can't bring it. So you're talking about millions of women, according to the data from the manufacturers themselves. Okay, can you then say, advise me what grounds on, on which the, pa the patients have sued? Yes, there's two very basic claims that will be seen in any lawsuit. One is that these devices are defective. And that generally means they are unreasonably dangerous. What doctors do is they balance the risks against the benefits. And unfortunately, the companies essentially created a market for these products by having their doctors who consulted and were being paid by them to speak at national conferences and publish articles saying that suture repairs, which has always been the tried and true way of treating these conditions, were not effective. So they needed these mesh materials, and they began to use those. Um, the studies that I think you can rely on where there's not industry funding behind them show that there really was not a need for the mesh, and in fact, it doesn't work any better. When you take the, that's the benefit side. When you look at the risk side, the risk are catastrophic complications that for many women cannot be treated. So when you put those two together and you say the risk outweighs the benefit, you have a defective product. The other claim is failure to warn. Doctors and patients have never been given the full story of the complications and the dangers they know of publicly. How do I know that? Because I've read the internal documents of these manufacturers, and I've seen the unbelievable internal conversations. And everything I'm telling you, by the way, is now public. I've tried these cases. These documents that I'm referring to are not confidential any longer. This is public information, although it hasn't been widely disseminated. And internally, for example, at Johnson & Johnson, they talked about running a registry where every woman who would get a ProLift, which was one of their products, would, would be counted and they could follow their progress. The medical people within the company said, no, we can't do that because then our risk and complication data will become more accurate, which would be bad for sales. And that would be bad for competition. So unfortunately, that's the thought process within the companies. Um, so those are the two main claims. The women are not warned, and their doctors especially are not told the truth about how serious the complications are and how untreatable they are for so many women. And the products are defective. It's unsafe to put polypropylene mesh in so many women. Can you advise, Mr. Slater, of the court actions that are pending? Is it the manufacturer who's been sued? Is it the clinician who's been sued? Or is it both? And what has been the outcome? 
It's a great question. It's both. It depends on the court. It depends on the, the client and the law firm that file it. Um, I just tried a case last month where both the doctor and the manufacturer had been sued. And many doctors um, are caught up in this because they didn't have the full information and they believed what they were told by the manufacturers about which women were appropriate women to have these put in their bodies. They basically said any woman's a good candidate and doctors believe that. And now when you look at the internal documents, it doesn't bear out. So there are doctors that are having lawsuits brought against them now. It's not as pervasive. Um, there's a thought process in United States litigation that you don't want to get the doctors angry by suing them. Um, that was the thought process early on. But more and more people now are suing their doctors because the doctors turned a blind eye to good data and instead just believe propaganda. And that's a problem for a doctor. Okay. Can I ask Angus MacDonald for a question? Okay. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, good morning again, Mr. Slater. Um, we're aware that the FDA uh, regulates the use of medical devices in, in the USA. Now, on the 29th of April last year, the FDA issued proposals to reclassify uh, surgical mesh for transvaginal uh, pelvic organ prolapse from a moderate risk device, a uh, class two, to a high risk device uh, and require all uh, manufacturers to submit pre-market approval. A application for the agency to evaluate safety and effectiveness. Has the FDA proposals to reclassify these products come into effect? And what's been the effect of any regulatory changes on the medical profession, uh, the regulators, and indeed the manufacturers? Uh, it's a good question. I will, I'll give you a three-part answer. The first part answer is that the FDA has not issued those orders yet, which is quite disappointing. Um, and unfortunately, it's typical of the regulatory authorities in the United States, they don't move quickly. And unfortunately, there's a collaboration between the FDA and the medical device manufacturers. Um, I've seen it in the internal documents. Before the FDA issues uh, pronouncements about MeSH, for example, they are consulting with the medical device manufacturers, and they're being lobbied. So there's a close relationship there, and it's unfortunate, and it it takes the FDA away from the neutral, objective position it should hold. So the answer is that is just sitting in limbo and nobody knows why. Um, what has the FDA done that has been positive? Well, when they issued what's called 522, 522 orders in early 2012, the result, what they were saying to the manufacturers was, you have to study these products more. And we want to see real studies robust studies, and that was a good thing. And many of the manufacturers pulled their products off the market instead of having them studied by these robust, what's called randomized controlled trials. It's a very damaging fact against these manufacturers. And I've seen the internal emails, for example, at Johnson & Johnson, again, these are public. When, that, when the orders were issued by the FDA, the very day they were issued, the regulatory affairs professionals at Ethicon and Johnson & Johnson were already asking, if we pull the product off the market, can we avoid having to do these studies? And products were pulled off. Johnson & Johnson, for example, pulled four of them off the market, both incontinence and prolapse devices, rather than doing those studies. And the conclusion there is there's never been a high-level study like the ones the FDA mandated that's ever been done that's proven the mesh to be safe and effective. That's never happened. Um, the third thing I'll tell you, again, kind of hearkening back to my first is, it, it's, and it, maybe it's the cynical side of me from doing this for a long time, but there's an expert for Johnson & Johnson in the mesh litigation who used to be a head of enforcement in the FDA, and we learned in his deposition that he actually side-switched in a matter where they were investigating a Johnson & Johnson company over a, a product, and then he switched and became a private consultant on that matter for the Johnson & Johnson company on the same matter. So you draw your own conclusions, but, but we who are a bit cynical don't really look to the FDA as, as an entity that has the resources or the structure to be able to actually protect women or other patients for that matter in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, that the reclassification hasn't actually happened yet. Uh, have the FDA given any indication to yourself or publicly uh, as to when the, the reclassification will happen or, or come into effect? I, I, I've seen nothing that indicates that they have given a, a time when they're going to do it. 
I'm, you're familiar with the documents and you're familiar with this, so everybody expected this was going to happen quickly because we're talking about the health and safety of women, and you should think they would move quickly. We have no uh, indication of when they're going to act. I will tell you in practice, because of the information that has started to come out, there are many doctors who are treating the products like high-risk devices, even without that classification, and there's many doctors who now refuse to use these devices because they're now learning. Un unfortunately, what we've found is that many women, when they have a complication, they leave their doctor. So their doctors think they're having wonderful results because the women aren't returning to them. The thing is, the women are going and finding the most high-level pelvic reconstructive surgeons, usually doctors who don't put mesh into women's bodies, to remove it. And there are studies published by Mayo Clinic doctors in Minnesota. There's a recent study, the first name of the uh, listed author is Abbott, where they recognize this across the board, that women typically do not return to their doctors when they have very serious complications. They go elsewhere. So doctors don't really know this. Fortunately, it's getting out now, and many doctors are avoiding these products, and, and, and that's a good development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Slater. It's good to have on our record uh, that clinicians in the states are uh, now refusing to use the, the, the implants, or at least some, some clinicians. Thank you. John Wilson. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Mr. Slater. The medicines and, health, medicines and healthcare products and regulatory agency in the UK continue to argue in, in, in a recent report the benefits outweigh the risks. What would be your advice to that regulatory body? What I would tell them is to look at the studies that are relied on by the mesh manufacturers. What you'll find is a few things. One, most of the studies they rely on are written or investigated by paid consultants. So I would throw those in the garbage immediately because if somebody is being paid by the manufacturer, there's a financial bias, and that's recognized in the scientific literature. Financial bias affects conclusions. That's number one. Number two, the very um, grandfather product in this area is considered the TVT by Johnson & Johnson. And the studies of the TVT in the late 1990s are really the bedrock studies supporting all the mid-urethral slings. Unfortunately, what people have not known is, for example, in that study, the lead investigator and the inventor of the TVT was a Dr. Olmsten, European doctor. Dr. Olmsten's contract with J&J &J had a clause in it that if he reported certain complications, he would lose a $400,000 payment. That's in his contract. That's acknowledged. And the studies by Nielsen, which are the 17-year long-term studies, well, we turned out in discovery, those are the same patients. So you had data that was paid for. And our discovery and our investigation has shown that. And I could send you reams of testimony on it. So the bedrock studies are not reliable. The studies they look at, safety is never the primary endpoint of those studies. They don't study safety the way that they should and in a robust and objective way. Rather, they look at, well, are you going to get yes, less leakage? Are the organs going to stay in the right place better? And modern concepts of these types of surgeries recognize that the most important thing is how does the woman feel? Because this is elective surgery that nobody needs. How does the woman feel? And after these surgeries, what you'll see is with the native tissue, the suture repairs, the reoperation rates are far lower than the reoperation rates with mesh. And the functional day-to-day -day life outcomes for the women are the same or better with the suture repairs. And study after study bears this out. The only thing the manufacturers can say is, well, with some of these mid-urethral slings, we have some studies that show that a woman will remain dry for a longer time, but at what cost? And the studies don't, in a robust and thorough way, study safety. And I can tell you from the internal documents, for example, from Ethicon, they admitted in depositions that the risks include, and, and I'm quoting them, life-changing complications, recurrent complex erosions, contraction of the mesh causing pain syndromes. These are things that are not in the warnings for most of the manufacturers. Their sales representatives will tell doctors that they are not serious risks. And therefore, when somebody tells you the benefits outweigh the risks, you have to look at the women who are su suffering the catastrophic complications. And it's easy to say, well, that doesn't bear out in reality. Mr. Slater, are you aware 
of the exchange of information between the US authorities, regulatory authorities, and other authorities throughout the world, including the UK? I'm not aware of the FDA sharing information with the UK or European regulatory authorities. I've not seen any documentation that that has happened. If it has, um, I'm not aware of it. Um, but I think that ultimately all of the regulatory authorities are, we have a saying in the United States, and I'm sure you probably have it over there, you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back at the regulatory authorities. They're, they're not funded the way that they would need to be, and there's only so many resources to go around, so you can only do so much. And the key information has not been shared. So the regulatory authorities don't have the full information. And again, look at the influence of the mesh manufacturers on these authorities. They meet regularly. They speak regularly. When something alarming is brought to the attention of the FDA, I've seen many documents showing they immediately pick up the phone and call the people at the manufacturer and say, hey, what's this? So it's not an arm's length objective process, unfortunately. Thank you very much indeed. Angela. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, Mr. Slater. Uh, under the current European Union um, relations and uh, manufacturer's role, is, is the responsibility of uh, the frame in the framework is clear. Uh, what role do manufacturers have within the U.S. Um, regulatory framework in both pre-market and post-market scrutiny of their products? It's a great question. In the United States. These mesh products were able to get on the market through what's called the 510K. And that's a, essentially an exception to the rule that says you have to actually get robust pre-market approval. These mesh products got on the market with basically a simple application that said this is, and the, the buzzword, the regulatory word is substantially equivalent to something else on the market. So what they said is, well, this is similar to hernia mesh, or this is similar to another mesh. Many of them used as their, what they call the predicate, the earlier product, something called, um, it, it was a product by Boston Scientific. It was a mid-urethral sling that was recalled from the market. But companies were able to rely on that to get on the market, and their approvals were not touched. So it takes very little for these mesh products to have gotten on the market. And as I was asked earlier, the robust protections that are used for drugs have never been instituted yet for these meshes. When they were threatened to have to do the types of studies you should have to do to get these on the market, many of these products got pulled off the market instead of doing the studies, as I mentioned earlier. So it's a very, very easy process compared to getting a drug on the market, for example. These products have never been scrutinized the way they need to be. Uh, thank you for that. How might this affect uh, clinics and healthcare providers a view of the information that the manufacturers have provided of their own product? Well, unfortunately, what happened is many physicians and hospitals said, oh, this sounds great. Let's stock it and let's allow it to be used. Um, that obviously hasn't worked out well. I have not seen an analysis of the cost to healthcare authorities and insurance companies but I, will, I would venture to guess that the numbers are going to be staggering. Because if you look, first of all, to put, use a suture to repair these conditions is not that inexpensive a procedure. The mesh is very expensive. So, for example, in your country, your government's paying for that. And then when a woman has complications, now she has to go and she has to have more examinations because the mesh is eroding or it's contracting. And every time the doctor sees the woman, that's another exam. And now you're going to do an ultrasound and try to image it. And then you're going to do a surgery to try to find it. And what this, the data also shows is once a woman has surgery, odds are she's going to start to have more surgery and more surgery. And for example, that's the Abbott article I cited to you that women end up with multiple operations and the complications are bad, so now you have multiple hospitalizations. So you have staggering, compounding, increasing costs to your government for this health care and these clinics. They don't have the wherewithal. So there's only a few places in the country where you can go and find doctors that actually are equipped to remove this mesh. And I'll tell you, I talk to these doctors all the time who remove it. They still have not established a safe and effective way to remove mesh from these women. I had a doctor the other day tell me that some of the hardest um, surgical scissors that they use to remove mesh are not 
effective and they have to use tools that they never imagined they would use in a woman's body to remove this because it's so tough and so difficult to remove. You won't find that information being given to doctors or the clinics, even today. Thank you. And what effect has this litigation have on the role of the manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, regulatory framework? Um, I, I know you've touched on it just briefly, but just to recap on that, uh, could you possibly expand on that a little? Sure. What the manufacturers have done is uh, damage control from the very start. And again, I've seen the internal documents. As soon as the FDA came out with their first public health notification in October of 2008, the manufacturers were putting out talking points that day saying, well, this is nothing different. And then the next public health notification came out in July of 2011, and then the meetings in September with the FDA. And what, and what the companies did is they had very polished members of their industry speak and try to convince the regulatory authorities everything is fine and testified contrary to what their internal documents showed, uh, which is frustrating and it's frustrating for any one of us who looks at this situation. Um, they've continually met with the regulatory authorities. They've delayed action. They have continued to peddle um, bought and paid for studies, studies run by their own funded consultants. And, and the FDA, which again, because of the way that things are structured, works in tandem with these manufacturers. And they feel like they need to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. We would prefer to see them be at arm's length and be, show much more scrutiny, but the manufacturers consider to continue to play their game. And I can tell you what I've been told by the manufacturers many of whom don't want to settle these cases, hey, there's no court that can handle all these cases, so let these women wait. And that's what I've heard. So that's their attitude. And I, and I implore you, you know, you're going to see a lot of women in your country, and the justice system needs to be beefed up, and there need to be special courts to give these women justice in a, in a, in a quick and efficient way, because in the United States, we have 70,000 women or more, and most have no hope of ever getting a, a, a court date or getting their case heard. And, and it's really tragic because you have women who are bankrupt, losing their marriages, suffering. They can't afford their medical expenses, and, and they really don't have any light at the end of their tunnel, unfortunately. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chief. Neil Finlay. Yeah, um, we've just heard from the uh, regulator, the UK regulator, uh, uh, who's looking into this. And um, it would appear from their evidence that they suggested that they, they wouldn't say that the problem or any of the problems were associated with the product. They spoke about the product being fit for purpose and that the benefits outweighed the risk. Looking at some of the list of the cases that have been settled in the US, it seems to be that most of them appear to have been because of defectively designed products. Is that the case or is that just the ones that I'm looking at that um, that's the reason? No, you're, you're correct. When the cases have gone to trial and a jury has decided the case, the plaintiff has won almost every single one of them. And in every case uh, that's been won, they've either found, in most of them it's been that it's a defective product. And the other part of being a defective product in United States law is if the warnings are inadequate, uh, that's considered a product defect as well because that means the doctor and the patient weren't able to balance the risks and benefits. And, and one of the things you'll see is when these cases actually get to a courtroom, and our hands are tied to a large extent by the evidence rules. For example, I try these cases. I have not yet been able to tell a jury that products I'm trying cases against have been withdrawn from the market by the manufacturer. I haven't been able to tell a jury yet, and this is, again, information that's been filed publicly, that Johnson & Johnson and Ethicon destroyed tens of thousands of pages of documents regarding their mesh products. Haven't been able to tell a jury that. Um, and the judges are doing the best job they can under the evidence rules. We have an, an intellectual disagreement. I think that a jury needs to know that, that certain of the medical directors at Ethicon who allowed their products to get on the market, their entire hard drives were wiped clean, and we never saw one of their internal documents. Um, it raises questions. I think a jury should be able to hear that. Uh, so when juries do get to hear the evidence, they actually do get to hear. What do they do? They find against the manufacturers, and the verdicts have uniformly been in the seven figures. And they've awarded punitive damages in several cases, which are damages in the United States to punish and send a message to these companies. So again, I would tell the regulators, if you want to know what's really going on, 
you need to take the time. And I tried to send documents in, to the parliament, and I understand you have certain rules that you're not allowed to keep those on file. But if you wanted those documents, I'd be happy to send you reams of deposition transcripts, sworn depositions, video depositions of medical directors, internal documents. Let the regulators look at that. Let them look at the inside truth in the emails. When people wrote emails eight years ago and didn't know that this was going to end up in court, when they were telling things in a candid way to one another within the manufacturers, tell them to talk to the doctors who are removing the mesh. Tell them to talk to them. Don't talk to the doctors who have a financial stake in seeing these products used. Talk to the ones who are removing it who don't use it. They'll give you the most honest, objective information, like the doctors at the Mayo Clinic who wrote about these catastrophic complications. And I'd be happy to have those studies emailed to you today. Welcome you can that. see them and you can see all that information. I would welcome that. Definitely would welcome that. Could it, um, so just to be clear on that, you, your clients have received um, a compensation payment even though the product has not been withdrawn for, from use. There are women who have, with, who have been, well, it, it's funny, received compensation. There are some women who have settled their cases and they've been settled on a confidential basis. Um, so I'm not allowed to talk much more about those. But the public jury verdicts have been both against the withdrawn products and the products that remain on the market. Yeah. It's not been limited to the withdrawn products. In fact, <laughs> the mid-urethral slings sold by both Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson and Ethicon have been the products in which plaintiffs have won trials in various states, including Texas, including the federal litigation in West Virginia, including a federal case that was in Florida. So it's not just the withdrawn products. And, and I'll tell you one other thing, because you asked me about what the regulators should look at. They're going to be shown studies. One of the things we learned in our discovery, the New England Journal of Medicine is considered to be maybe the most prominent medical journal in the world, or at least they bill themselves that way. Through our discovery, we were able to show that a study published about one of Johnson & Johnson's mesh devices, that Ethicon had sign significant involvement in the design of the study, the analysis of the data, and the writing of the manuscript, yet the author had said that there was no involvement in any of these things. And when I took the deposition of the editors of New England Journal of Medicine, I had got a court order from the state court judge in the state of Massachusetts because they fought me like crazy. We not only found out more about that, which is that there was not a disclosure of involvement by industry, but that certain of the data was unreliable because the measurements done of women's reprolapse had not been done in a valid way. And that entire study was invalid in the opinion of our experts. That study still sits on the books. So again, when you see published studies, and I would tell that to any regulator, look with great scrutiny. Look with great scrutiny at those studies. Two final things. One is that we have a, a um, national health service here, different health service from you have. but. Um, what do you think, as an outsider looking in, is the, are the implications for our National Health Service, uh, financial implications for our National Health Service of this? Well, I think I can say it in very basic terms. Surgery with mesh is more expensive. The consequences are incredibly expensive because women need intensive medical care when the complications happen. There are... They will tell you, oh, well, if a woman has some erosion of the mesh, it's not that big a deal. It can be easily fixed. Well, that's not what the data shows. It shows that over 50% of women need surgery. And that, as I told you, the studies show that women end up with multiple operations. And by the way, this is a lifelong risk. And as a woman ages and her, the tissue of her body ages, she's at a higher risk for the mesh contracting and eroding. So it's a risk that's going to go on. And I had in deposition testimony with a doctor from California who's maybe removed more mesh than any doctor in the United States or the world. His name is Shlomo Raz, R-A-Z. He's a very highly published, highly respected urologist and pelvic reconstructive surgeon. He referred to it as a social cancer in sworn testimony. And he's somebody who used to use the mesh. And he said when women started showing up seven and eight years later with complications, he looked at this and said, you know what? I can't do this anymore, and he has ceased putting this mesh in any women's bodies, and all he would do is cut small pieces and put it into a woman's body, not these large kits, not these kits for the urethral slings. He was using smaller amounts, carefully placed, and he has stopped using it. So what's the implication? It's going to be costly, and every time a woman gets this, 
you have a 50-50 chance that she's going to be someone who's going to need a lot of care. That's what the data shows. One final thing. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned the conflict of interest. That it was one of the things I wanted to raise with the regulator but didn't have time. It appears that this whole issue is riddled with conflicts of interest between the manufacturers, um, doctors, um, various different clinicians, the regulator, whether that be in the US, whether that be in the UK, Europe, uh, throughout the world, this whole thing seems to be wound up in a whole series of conflicts uh, of interest. Is that something that you know you would agree with? I would agree with it 100 uh, percent. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you something that's very shocking. I, again, I refer to the internal documents from the manufacturers. I'm a lawyer, and when we get those documents, that means a lot to us. So maybe I'm a little biased on it, but that's what they said internally when they didn't think anyone would see it. And I'll give you a great example. The medical director at Ethicon is a doctor named Pete Hinoul, a Belgian urogynecologist. He was hired by Ethicon and Johnson & Johnson. And in an email, he talked about one of their highest paid consultants, a Dr. Vince Lucenti, who's been paid $1.7 million by the company. And he said when his group publishes that they have no erosions, nobody believes that. So he's essentially saying they're publishing false data. While at the same time, one day before, the company authorized $400,000 in payments to that same doctor because he was so good at marketing the product to other doctors. And again, this is someone who's published studies saying he had no erosions on multiple occasions. And the doctors within Ethicon know that's not true, yet they use them to promote the product, to speak at national professional societies, to publish literature. And then they use similar types of doctors to lobby organizations. I'll give you another example. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists published what's called a practice bulletin in February of 2007, calling these procedures experimental. The internal documents show that this same Dr. Lucenti and other doctors that were paid consultants lobbied behind the scenes because they were worried that the insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid, our government payers, would not pay for experimental procedures. They got ACOG to change that and remove the word experimental in 2007. The email showed this Dr. Lucenti writing to the marketing people at the company saying this is a great victory. And the email from the marketer at Ethicon says, I love you, man. I'm doing the happy dance. Because, and every one of these emails talks about we're going to be able to get paid for these surgeries. There's not one word about women's safety mm -hmm. or health or whether it was right to call them experimental. And absolutely, it was the right thing to do. And by the way, one of the other lobbyists for Ethicon at the time, one of their consultants, she now works for regulatory affairs at ACOG, mm -hmm. lobbying the FDA. Mm -hmm. So I have all those documents. None of them are confidential anymore. If you want them, I have them here for you. I look forward to receiving them from you. Thanks. Mr. Slater, uh, just one final question. Uh, obviously, you've been heavily involved in, in the over the past couple of years. Have you at any given time been approached by a regulator? to provide any evidence or any information and indeed in turn have you ever offered any evidence or information to the regulator? The regulatory authorities in the United States have never picked up the phone and called me. They've never asked for information from me. Um, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of them asking any of the attorneys that are involved in this litigation for such assistance. So the regulators have step, stayed far away from People like myself who would be more than happy to give them all of the internal documents I've obtained to show them the true story. They haven't asked for it, which is a shame. Would that same offer be made to the UK regulator? I'd be happy to provide anything that's requested. I have everything here, anything that is no longer confidential, and I've dutifully uh, battled to de-designate documents and make them not lo no longer confidential. I'd be happy to provide those to anybody who asked. Mm -hmm. Just one final question on that. Have you ever approached the regulator to, to offer that evidence? Um, I have written to the uh, regulators and um, provided information. Um, I've never been approached. No, have, have you approached our regulator? I've offered to provide information. Okay. I've never been approached. Had somebody say to me, yes, provide us anything. Okay, then. Any further questions? Mr. Slater, can I thank you for giving evidence on this petition? And can I also apologize 
uh, people are keeping you late. And uh, but as you're probably aware, that there is a, a great deal of public interest in this petition. And uh, so again, can I thank you for providing that, uh, your evidence, and uh, it was very much appreciated. And you can go and have a happy you're welcome. breakfast. I, I appreciate. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the opportunity because um, there's a lot of women who really need people to stand up for them. And I think that ultimately it's, it is the politicians and it's the members of parliament in your country who need to stand up for them because they really don't have anybody to really battle for them. And I, and I just I feel honored to be able to, to do this for them because I know how hard they're working there in Scotland. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, We'll now ask the committee to decide on what action it wishes to take on this petition. Uh, members have a note by the clerk that sets out the possible course of actions. What are the members' views? Do we agree then that we, we, we draw the, uh, that the committee draws to the Scottish Government the attention of the evidence heard with the request that is taken into account uh, for a review? And we have also agreed that. Uh, we are going to meet with the Cabinet Secretary, the Chair of Independent View on Transfer General Measuring Plans and the European Commission. Does the committee agree that this should be after the publication of the Independent Review's findings? Neil? I ask that you do, the committee, to do one other thing, and that is to ensure that um, the documentation that Mr Slater uh, has offered is sent to both the Scottish Government uh, and the MH MHRA, uh, and um, I, I don't know whether the Scottish Government then uh, has to look at that and then make a reassessment of where it is, or whether the Scottish Government needs to pass that on to ind individual health boards. Um, it might be that when the Cabinet Secretary comes, we can we can hear what our views are on the evidence that Mr Slater uh, produces, but um, I think we have to take into account the the, I think, very substantial evidence that he's going to provide, um, and that has to be part of the committee's deliberations, because that will, given that he's saying that there are, in, there are internal documents from the manufacturers that show, in his view, some very serious things, then I think that would be something that the committee would want to know. Well, I think, I, I th I think that's right, right for important. So the action it will take in is that we will take today's evidence, pass it on to the Scottish Government for, for information. We are going to have the Cabinet Secretary and others in for further evidence. I'm quite sure that everything that was said here today will be part of that report, part of that evidence session. So, can I thank... Uh, Just the evidence that Mr Slater is going to provide, could that be provided to, um, um, for example, myself, as well yeah. as committee members, and also to the, um, to the MESH group? been advised when that comes in, Neil, but we, we'll review that and we'll come right. back and let okay. people know. So, I now form a close of meeting. Can I thank uh, uh, the gallery for being here and uh, as you know that it has got certainly public interest and, and uh, hopefully what you've heard today, uh, well it might not be the solution, at least it's, it's, it's probably more evidence that we can take into account uh, for, future, for future evidence sessions. So thank the public gallery, thank the committee members and now form a close of meeting.